Okay, I just wanted to start out today by talking a little bit about uh, just going over a few questions that were commonly missed on the last exam now that everybody's taken it. Um, feel free, I have a I've had a number of you come in and look over your exam, feel free to still do that. I'll be in my office after class today, and I'm also going to come in tomorrow. I'll probably be in before nine and might stay a little after 11, but I'll be here for sure between nine and 11. So that's a good time to come look at the exam or talk about anything else. I'll be around. Uh, so this question was the one that was most commonly missed. Only about a quarter of you got this one right. And I, I didn't really expect, I, I can't remember if this was a question that I made up or not, but what I was really getting at, I was trying to fashion a question, I'm pretty sure, um, asking what are virulence factors? Just a very general question. Uh, and an organism that has a lot of virulence factors, remember those are kind of tools that it has like toxins or antiphagocytic factors or extracellular enzymes, things that make it successful in establishing an, an infection. All right, so the correct answer here is if, if an organism causes disease most of the time, then that's probably got a lot of virulence factors. So I didn't intend for that one to be a tricky question. Um, if an organism is an opportunist, then it's rarely going to cause disease. Only when certain conditions are just right, usually the host is immunocompromised. Okay, so uh, that one was commonly missed. Uh, this question about SXT, uh, I think most of you knew that that was an antibiotic that acted on folic acid synthesis, but then the, well, so what? Why do we need folic acid? Or why do bacteria need folic acid? They need that to synthesize DNA. It's actually a coenzyme that's necessary for certain enzymes that are necessary for uh, replication. Uh, and this one, I, I kind of squished this together because I was trying to save on printing costs there. So I don't think that threw anybody off, hopefully. Uh, but just the, the bacterial resistance, it's easy to get confused about what's doing what. Um, if, if the organism can alter their porin structure, remember the porin is, uh, those are transport channels in the outer membrane. So you may have seen LPS. Oh yeah, that's gram negative. No, the it's true. It is only in gram negatives, but these, uh, if they can alter those membrane, those transport channels to not let the antibiotic in the cell, then the cell is more likely to withstand the, the antibiotic to be resistant to it. Uh, and then lastly, I, this one wasn't among the most common ones in this, but there was a, a point of confusion that I didn't anticipate. Um, so I'm asking, how would you best sterilize a vaccine? And I said that it was heat sensitive. So that means, well, autoclaving involves heat and pasteurization involves heat. So it's not one of those answers. Um, lyophilization and freezing, uh, sorry, lyophilization and freezing both involve cold temperatures. Um, those are not going to kill anything that's contaminating the vaccine. Uh, it's it's just going to keep it from multiplying. All right. So the correct answer here is filtering. We can have very small filters that even will filter out viruses. All right. And so, so for something that's heat sensitive, like a drug or a vaccine, that's, that's a good way to sterilize it. I think there was some confusion. Of course, COVID-19 vaccines have to be kept cold. Okay. That's not so that it kills any contaminants, it's so that the messenger RNA doesn't degrade. So that might have been something I didn't anticipate, but okay. So again, feel free to stop in and look over your exam anytime on our own.
All right, so where we left off last time, we started adaptive immunity and we were talking about um, some of the cells, some of the process, processes that are important there in adaptive immunity. Uh, we were talking about the lymphatic system, um, primary lymphoid organs, remember red bone marrow and um, uh, thymus, or almost said something else. Uh, the B and T cells are made in the red bone marrow and the B cells mature in that red bone marrow, T cells mature in the thymus. So that means they um, get their T cell receptors, they differentiate into different types of T cells. Uh, the T cells with T cell receptors that would recognize self are, we have a mechanism to get rid of those sorts of cells. So that happens in, in the maturation process. Uh, and then the secondary lymphoid organs, lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, um, all of that, the, the lymph nodes, we're going to look at a close up of a lymphoid capillary and a lymph node as well. Um, all that lymph that's traveling through our lymphatic vessels, uh, it's always going to dump back into uh, the bloodstream, the place in our body where the blood pressure is the lowest. Uh, and that's up here near the heart. You have two sub subclavian veins. Uh, that's where the blood pressure is lowest. So those cells, those lymphocytes that are traveling around in our lymph, they actually travel between our lymph then they dump back into our bloodstream and then they eventually diffuse out of the bloodstream, uh, end up in the lymph. So they're kind of traveling back and forth between uh, the lymphatic vessels and our blood vessels. All right, so if you look at a close up of a lymphatic capillary and think about, well, what is lymph really exactly? Um, leaving the bloodstream uh, at a small rate all the time, we would have kind of diffusing out, uh, we would have some fluid like water, you know, blood plasma, and some proteins associated with that. Um, certainly gases are diffusing out like oxygen to get out to our tissues. Um, at times we're gonna have cells leaving the bloodstream, diffusing out into the tissues. Uh, and all those things are going to be leaving the bloodstream an even greater amount when those blood vessels dilate during an inflammatory response. Okay, where do all those things end up when the, when the, the pressure in the tissues is greater than the pressure in the lymphatic capillary, um, all those things are going to end up diffusing into a lymphatic uh, capillary. All right, so during um, an inflammatory reaction, right, you're gonna have more fluid leaving, uh, that swelling, it's going to end up being more lymph, basically. <laughs> okay, and those cells will eventually end up in the lymphatic capillaries. Um, there are valves in here. They're kind of hard to see here, but there's valves so that the lymph can only travel in one direction. Uh, and how does it travel? We don't have a lymph pump, right? Um, it travels by smooth muscle action. So it's rather slow. Apparently that when we move our skeletal muscles, that helps stimulate lymph to move as well. So if you need an excuse to exercise, say, okay, you gotta get my lymph moving. That's good for my uh, fighting off pathogens. Um, and so where, did it, where is that lymph moving? Uh, it's moving via the lymphatic vessels in the direction towards the heart. So again, it, all that lymph's moving up towards your subclavian veins that will eventually Again, dump that stuff back back into your your bloodstream. Um, if you but if, but before it goes there, it's going to have to pass through a number of lymph nodes. Like I said last time, you have somewhere between the neighborhood of like 500 and 600 lymph nodes in your body. Uh, a lot, especially clustered in your neck and armpits and groin area. Um, what, why do we have so many lymph nodes? What happens there? Well, first take a look. You've got several different afferent lymphatic vessels. And that means uh, afferent means, means towards the lymph node. Okay, so afferent means towards something. Uh, so you've got, let's see, one, two, three, four afferent lymphatic vessels 
entering into that lymph node. Uh, and you've only got a couple of efferent lymphatic vessels, vessels, vessels. Uh, and efferent means away from, moving away from, or outward from something, all right? So that's no accident. We have more coming in and fewer leaving. So that creates kind of a bottleneck of lymph. Uh, that lymph has to kind of circulate around here in the lymph node a little bit and spend some time there. And think about what's traveling in the lymph. You've got say macrophages that have engulfed some pathogen. And we're gonna talk about shortly how it's going to present parts of that pathogen on its surface. And so when it comes in contact with B and T cells, uh, it's looking for a B and T cell that has a receptor that's going to match up with that pathogen. Okay, so where that happens is in the lymph nodes. Okay, so this is a place where lots of cells are mixing together and the correct B and T cells are, you know, looking to match up, finding that the antigen that they are specific for. I haven't talked about that word yet, antigen. You could think, you know, parts of pathogens. Okay, uh, and of course, this is intimately associated with, with the blood supply. So we've got cells, you know, leaving the blood supply there uh, and, and entering into the lymph. Now, sometimes, if you've ever been to the doctor, you know, maybe you're whatever, you think you have strep throat or whatever, usually the doctor will feel your lymph nodes in your neck to see if they're swelled up. Okay, so during inflammation or during an infection, we get more cells, more fluid, more lymph. Okay, so the lymph nodes tend to swell during an infection. Um, once the infection's resolved, then the swelling will, will go back down. Okay, so that's just a sign of infection that, that we look for. Uh, all right, so uh, moving on, we need to talk about antigens. I've tried not to use that word before we actually define it, but it's been kind of hard. Uh, something that's an antigen, um, that is a molecule that the body recognizes as foreign. Okay, so it's going to elicit an immune response. Um, the reason that we call these molecule antigens, they're antibody generators, all right? So if you get mixed up, what's the good thing, what's the bad thing? Antibodies are what we want to fight infection and antigens are what elicit their uh, production, I guess you could say. Okay, so what kind of things act as antigens? Uh, here's some examples, various bacterial components, proteins, especially viruses, fungi, protozoa. Also things that are not alive can act as antigens. Um, we don't necessarily want them to, but food or dust can act as antigen. Um, if you have food allergies, then certain kinds of foods elicit some kind of immune response. And we don't want that to happen, uh, but potentially can. Okay, so um, something, you, and then usually like an antigen, like a, a bacteria can be an antigen, uh, but can have lots of different spots that would be recognized by say our B and T cell receptors. Okay, so those different shapes we refer to as epitopes. Okay, so these are regions of antigens. Uh, that are recognized by uh, our B and T cell receptors. Okay. Uh, another name for epitopes, um, also called antigenic determinants. I usually use the term epitope. Um, and so this, this picture 
uh, illustrate that, that illustrates that term a little bit. There's a pretty good picture in your textbook as well. I kind of like that picture better, but for some reason the publisher didn't include that in uh, on my package. So I found this one. Um, so we might say, you know, maybe some protein is antigenic, but then a protein would have lots of different shapes on it, or maybe lots of different epitopes that individual antibodies or B cell or T cell receptors could, could um, recognize. Um, actually, this is not quite correct to say T cell receptors. Let's just say, um, let's say B cell receptors um, or antibodies. Okay, I'll, I'll get to why that wasn't quite correct in a minute. If, if you wrote it though, that's, that's fine. Okay, so um, epitopes, on, on antigens. Um, what makes a good antigen? So in other words, when would an antigen elicit a really good immune response? When would our immune system notice it? Um, and of course, we've, we've had to ask this question a lot uh, with COVID, COVID. We're trying to, you know, the vaccine, all the vaccines to COVID, they almost all incorporate the spike protein of COVID. Uh, that's because that's the most antigenic part of the virus. We can't get our immune system to notice other parts of it. So um, almost all the vaccines incorporate that spike protein in some way. So something that's a good antigen is going to have uh, high complexity and a distinct shape. Those two things in my mind kind of go hand in hand. They're kind of similar concepts to be really complex or to have a distinct shape. Okay, so if, if, if the molecules have distinct shapes, then that's just more epitopes for our immune system to be able to recognize. Um, another quality of, of a uh, good antigen is a large size. Okay, things that are really small aren't, aren't recognized very well by our immune system. Uh, so again, larger molecules, better antigens. If the molecular weight is too small, they typically don't, aren't recognized. There are exceptions to that. Um, small molecules sometimes can link up with a larger molecule and get, and get uh, noticed that way. Okay, so a molecule that's really small could act as a haptin. Okay, that means that again, it binds up with something larger and then gets noticed. Uh, an example of a haptin would be uh, so an example poison ivy oil. Okay, that molecule is actually pretty small. I think it's like 200 Dalton, something like that. I'm not sure. It's a really small molecule and it shouldn't be antigenic. But for most of us, when we touch poison ivy and get that oil on our skin, we get a, we get a rash, we get itchiness, redness, we get an immune response, um, a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, the reason is that it's urochiol, I think is the name of that poison ivy oil. It actually, when it soaks into our skin, it links up with, with proteins in our skin uh, and acts as a haptin, links up with these carrier proteins and then our immune system notices it. Okay, so what kind of molecules are gonna be good antigens? Usually proteins are going to be the best at eliciting an immune response. Okay, so here's just an example of, of an enzyme. This is actually the enzyme beta-galactosidase. That's the enzyme that splits lactose into its two monosaccharides. Uh, when you look at that, you think, wow, proteins, really complex, okay, high complexity and distinct shapes. We got uh, alpha helices, beta sheets, lots of nooks and crannies in there, lots of different epitopes. Uh, something that's a lipoprotein, a lipid and protein together, or um, a glycoprotein, meaning a sugar attached to a protein are gonna be more mid-range uh, in terms of eliciting an immune response. Usually something that has lots of repeating monomers in it, 
uh, something like a polysaccharide is usually going to be not very antigenic. Now, there are exceptions here always, and we'll talk about some exceptions, but something here like starch, lots of glucoses over and over again, typically that's not noticed very well by our immune system. Uh, I get lots of repeating subunits. Typically, DNA is not terribly antigenic. Okay, again, same thing over and over again. All right, so more terminology we use with antigens. Uh, there are exogenous antigens and endogenous antigens. Um, like you would guess from that prefix, um, an exogenous antigen is one that enters the body from outside. Okay, so it enters through some portal of entry. Maybe we breathe it in, for example. Could be a bacteria, a virus, a fungus. Could be just about anything. Um, an endogenous antigen is one that's inside the cell. Okay, so a virus would start out as exogenous, but once it's successful at you know entering one of our cells, now it becomes an endogenous antigen. Okay, so we have different ways, we have different aspects of our immunity is going to deal with a, an exogenous antigen in a different way than it will an endogenous antigen. Um, uh, antigenic particles that are derived from normal cellular processes, these are autoantigens. That prefix auto means self. Okay, you write an autobiography, you're writing your life story, your own life story. Okay, so autoantigens under normal circumstances should not be causing an immune response. We have mechanisms so that they don't, but sometimes those mechanisms fail uh, and we get things like, uh, here's an example of somebody that's suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. All right, they're something, um, I don't, I don't really know the, the mechanism of that, but uh, somebody's antigens are targeting their joints, or sorry, antibodies are targeting self antigens in their joints and, and causing that deformation. Uh, and then one that your book doesn't really mention here, uh, super antigens. Um, these are antigens that can cause a overly inappropriate immune response, way more than what, what is necessary, a hyperimmune response. So an example of this is toxic shock syndrome toxin. Um, toxic shock syndrome is a disease caused typically by Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and that organism secretes this toxin that acts as a super antigen. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, this picture kind of this gets ahead of us a little bit, but it's kind of a good introduction to what we're gonna be talking about in a little bit of how, a, how it's the problem that a super antigen causes. Um, so normally when antigens, when our cells um, recognize, when our T cells recognize a normal antigen, so an antigen presenting cell, this could be maybe a macrophage, for example, uh, macrophage, it presents the, the black thing here. This is the antigen. It's kind of hard to see that. Um, T cells actually don't recognize antigen like directly. It has to be presented to them in a certain way with these certain kinds of receptors that we'll talk about. Um, but normally you would only have maybe a couple T cells in your body that would recognize a certain antigen. Uh, and then, you know, we make more if more are necessary. But with a super antigen, we actually, it, it's, it's too much of a nonspecific response. So we have as many as maybe 20% of the whole, all the T cells in our body recognize that antigen. And then, so the, the inflammation that's produced is just, just skyrockets because we have so many T cells responding. Okay, so typically, uh, you know, patients can, can go into shock meaning the inflammation makes their blood vessels too leaky. You get 
too much fluids and cells leaving their blood vessels. They're not getting uh, oxygen to their tissues and they can potentially die from, from going into shock. So um, that's just a good illustration of a super antigen. Um, your book illustrates the other antigens here. And I, I always think sometimes our eyes kind of just pass over. Oh yeah, that's a picture of that. Um, it's, it's always good maybe to test yourself. Okay, can I draw out what a exogenous antigen might actually be? Can I draw out an endogenous antigen? So when you're trying to test yourself, when you're trying to study, um, you know, cover up that picture and see if you can remember, see if you can replicate it. Uh, exogenous antigens here, remember, they're just some kind of extracellular microbe or virus, um, you know, surface proteins that act as antigens there. An endogenous antigen, so a virus is inside of the cell here. We actually have ways, we're going to get to this shortly, of, of advertising on the outside of our cell if, if our cell is in, uh, uh, in, infested, uh, infected with a virus. Okay, so we have these endogenous antigens on the surface of the cell because, again, we've had ways to kind of sample our cell and advertise what's going on within it. Uh, and then an autoantigen, just normal cell antigens, normally uh, our, our B cells and T cells are just gonna ignore those uh, if everything's working appropriately. All right, so let's get to, to we're gonna talk about B cells first and then we'll get to T cells, All right? So let's see. Where do we find B cells? Primarily, we're going to find these in sec secondary lymphoid tissue. Okay, so lymph nodes, uh, lymphatic vessels, spleen, okay, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Okay, that's primarily where we're going to find lymph nodes. They're going to be in the bloodstream as well, kind of passing back and forth between the bloodstream and lymph. Uh, and this is a close up of the B cell receptor. Okay, so BCR is a B cell receptor. Uh, and you can see that it has a, a transmembrane portion there, it's anchored into the membrane of the outside of our B cell. Um, it's got a, a heavy chain, two heavy chains. We call them heavy chains because they're high molecular weight. Uh, and then two light chains. Okay, and then two sites here that recognize epitopes of antigens. So here's some, maybe this is a bacterial cell, for example, and, and the epitope would be maybe some, some protein on the surface of the bacterial cell that that B cell receptor recognizes. Okay, it, these two uh, variable regions here um, on the tips of that B cell receptor, they're going to recognize the same antigen. Okay, so it seems like it would make sense if one would recognize one thing and the other would recognize something else, but that's, that's not the way it works. And I'll explain that more a little bit. Okay, so they recognize, uh, they have the same variability uh, on each one. Um, and there are, you know, we usually draw one B cell receptor, but on the surface of a B cell, there's more like 500,000 B cell receptors, okay, on the surface of the cell. Okay, so that's a crowded place the outside uh, of cells. And all, all of those B cell receptors recognize the same thing, recognize the same antigen or the same epitope, you could say, All right? So, and again, it seems like it would make more sense if we had one B cell that had lots of different specificities. And then when we're trying to find, you know, our macrophages are trying to get some help with some particular antigen, it'd be more likely to run into a B cell that would be able to, you know, then become activated. But actually, when we get, you know, 
the B cell receptor recognizing one epitope, this, this actually makes a very weak signal. Um, we actually need lots and lots of B cell receptors on the same cell recognizing the same thing to make a strong enough signal to actually cause some action uh, and some cytokines to be produced. So it, it really makes sense that they all recognize the same thing. Okay, so I, I alluded to the fact that B cells have to be activated. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna come back to this in just a second and we're gonna actually look at that more in depth later. But I wanna think about once they are activated, what, what do they actually do? <laughs> well, they get a little bit bigger uh, they divide and they differentiate into two kinds of cells. Uh, number one, into antibody secreting plasma cells. Okay, I meant to leave that off and then make you write it in, but anyway, that didn't happen. Uh, so they different into the plasma cells and then it's the plasma cells that are kicking out antibodies. Um, some of those B cells will differentiate into memory cells, memory B cells. So actually the next time that that pathogen is encountered, that memory B cell doesn't need additional activation. It can just start making antibody right away. So we get a quicker response the next time. All right, so how does that activation happen? Um, two ways, and again, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but for now, um, sometimes the B cells are gonna be dependent on T helper cells to activate them, to make antibodies. Um, and, but sometimes they are going to be independent. of T helper cells. So in other words, uh, the antigen, they, the B cell receptors recognize the antigen directly, and then they just start differentiating into plasma cells. Okay, most of the time we need T helper cell help because most of the time we wanna make sure that, that that's an appropriate response. So we need kind of lots of checks and balances to make sure it's appropriate. Um, there are in some, some instances where we don't need that and the, the B cell will just activate all by itself. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna go into that process more once we talk about T cells. So hold that thought, we'll come back to it. I like your book's picture of a plasma cell. Um, you know, when you learn about eukaryotic cells, you, you learn about all those organelles, oh, here's one lysosome and, you know, here's, you know, the ER and all that, you, you know, you put one thing in each cell, but it depends on what kind of cell it is as to what organelles are gonna be in there. So with a plasma cell, you can see it's mostly filled up of these, of, of rough ER. So remember a plasma cell cell's job is to be secreting proteins, secre secreting antibodies. So. Those antibodies are made on the ribosomes that are embedded in the ER, and then they are you know, shunted through that transpate port membrane. There are a few Golgi's here and there. Um, I think these blue things are mitochondria, so we need some energy being pumped out. But most of the cell is rough ER because that's the job of that cell to be secreting enzymes. Sorry, not enzymes, antibodies that are proteins. Okay, and there are different kinds of plasma cells, but the ones that are really active uh, are, are gonna be pumping out about 2000 antibodies per second. All right, so these are antibody factories. There are some longer acting plasma cells that produce antibodies more slowly over a long period of time. Um, but it's quite astonishing if you think about. They typically don't, they're short-lived, you know, high metabolism, they wear out pretty quickly, but it's not always the case. All right, so the, the plasma cells are pumping out antibodies that have the same specificity as the B cell receptor uh, on that original B cell. All right, so let's think about antibodies, their structure, 
what they do, the different isotypes, the different types of antibodies and what, what they're good at. Okay, so if you, if you look at the structure, and by the way, antibodies are also, they're, they're a type of immunoglobulin. So you might hear that term, it, that term's pretty closely syn synonymous with antibodies. So, um, and if you look at the structure over here of an antibody, you'll see it looks a lot like a B cell receptor. Um, We've got the antigen binding site at the top. That's the variable region. Uh, the two heavy chains. Um, this, the part that binds the antigen, um, we call it the FAB. That's the uh, fragment of antibody binding. Okay, so the FAB region, sorry, not antibody binding, antigen. That's the part that binds to the epitopes of antigen. Uh, a hinge region, so these are actually kind of flexible, kind of like put your arms up and swing back and forth on your waist a little bit. Uh, and then the stem region, um, FC region, that stands for uh, the fragment that's crystallizable. Okay, but you get this FC region, that's, that's the stem. Um, so again, two heavy chains, two light chains. Um, the stem region here, there's actually five different versions that we see of that stem region. And it depends when the antibody was made, which area of the gene was transcribed. Was it the mu region of the gene? If it was, then we get IgM. These are the different, uh, the five isotypes. Okay, if it was the gamma region of the gene, then we get IgG antibodies, um, IgA, IgE, and IgD. So those are the different uh, types, isotypes of antibody that we see. Um, your book includes a different, uh, it's a different crystallization picture showing an antibody. Um, I like this picture. This is called a space filling model where actually um, each atom is represented by a little ball in this model. Um, and I like that because it, you kind of get to understand the incredible variability that we get here uh, at the ends, uh, almost like a puzzle piece. Okay, the incredible variability. We can make antibodies that will recognize pretty much anything that we would come in contact with. Okay, so you kind of appreciate uh, the variability there. And we'll talk a little bit about briefly about how that uh, variability is generated. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about how antibodies function. What do they actually do? Okay, well, there's five different ways that we describe how they work. Um, one is neutralization. Okay, so you can see here, I think the antibodies are drawn much larger than what they actually are here. Uh, but you can see we can have antibodies sticking to bacteria or viruses or even toxins. Uh, and those antibodies are, are binding to epitopes that might be important for that bacteria or virus to adhere to its target cells. Okay, so if it can block adhesion molecules, then it's gonna keep that virus or bacterium from uh, infecting the cell that it's meant to infect. Okay, or it can neutralize the toxin just by sticking all to the outside of it. Uh, we know that antibodies can activate uh, complements and by activating complement can activate inflammation. So just a little review of our complement pathway there with that classical activation that involves an antibody bound to some antigen that's gonna act on that C1 uh, complement protein that then will cause the C1 to split the C2 and the C4 and so on and so forth. Um, some of these bits end up increasing inflammation. Uh, so 
Okay. Uh, we'll say the FC region of the antibody, that's the stem region, remember, activates C1. Okay, and again, that's, that's that classical activation. There's two other ways, remember, that complement can be activated, either by the pathogen itself or that lectin, man lectin mannose pathway. Antibodies can also act as opsonins. Remember, an opsonin is going to increase the chances that phagocytosis will be successful. Okay, um, and that can act, so let's see, increases phagocytosis. Our phagocytes have receptors for that stem portion of antibodies. Okay, so uh, the antibody can fit right in there. And when the antibody is bound to the pathogen, then those pseudopods are going to have a better time, easier time of grabbing hold of that pathogen and actually uh, phagocytizing it. Okay, so it's kind of like if you're climbing a wall, if you don't have handles to hold on to, rock climbing, uh, then you're going to not be very successful doing it. So it kind of gives us gives the phagocyte handles to hold on to to be more successful at phagocytizing. Okay, agglutination. Uh, if you if something's agglutinated, that means it's all clumped together. Okay, and our immune system is going to notice larger molecules much more easily. All right, so um, write that here. Clumps. Uh, more easily noticed. Okay, they tend to get filtered out in either uh, the lymph nodes or the spleen. Spleen filters blood, lymph nodes filter lymph. All right, so here is why we see how it's an advantageous for the antibodies to recognize the same epitope. Okay, so if they're grabbing hold of lots of, you know, epitopes, maybe one from one cell, one from another, you can see how you get big clumps of bacteria or virus again, and that can be more easily noticed. Uh, and then the last way is going to involve a uh, natural killer lymphocyte. Okay, um, the natural killer cells act, also have these F FC stem receptor uh, proteins. Uh, and when they recognize the tail of an antibody, uh, they are stimulated to release a couple of cytokines, uh, perforin and granzyme. And we're gonna talk more about those cytokines because that's the same one of the methods that cytotoxic T cells use to kill cells. Uh, so we'll talk more about those later, but uh, the natural killer cell releases those cytokines and that brings about uh, the death of that pathogen. Okay, so most of the time antibodies are kind of acting to help other aspects of our immunity, you know, clumping up cells or making phagocytosis uh, more likely or increasing inflammation. Uh, but sometimes they can really act a little bit more directly here. Uh, Again, again in, in conjunction with an NK cell. All right, so I, like I said, we have five different isotypes or classes of antibody. And because of their structure, some of them are better at some of those functions uh, than others. So uh, let's learn a bit about each one of those classes. Uh, the IgM, what, what's special about IgM? Uh, the first thing we think of, this is the first isotype produced uh, during the course of an infection. Okay, so when uh, the B cell first gets activated uh, into and differentiates into plasma cells, those plasma cells always start pumping out IgM antibody first. And these are kind of distinctive because they're usually bind up together 
um, five of them together. So it's as a, as a pentamer. So we have 10 different binding sites. Uh, so when it's in circulation, again, it usually uh, comes together as a pentamer. Um, how does it come together? It has something to do with this, with this what's called a little protein called a J chain. And that's this little um, arc right here. We think that has something to do with bringing the monomers together into a pentamer. Um, it's also referred to as an accessory molecule. So what, it, what, is, what are IgM antibodies good at? They're really good at agglutination because they have uh, 10 binding sites uh, for, for antigen, um, also good at, at neutralizing uh, at adhesion sites. Not really a lot of them in terms of total antibody in the blood kind of make a fairly low percentage because usually um, the plasma cells will pretty soon after start getting signals to change into a type of antibody that might better suit whatever infection it's dealing with. Okay, so we call that process class switching. When plasma cells, again, get cytokine signals that tell them how to best fight the infection and they'll start uh, pumping out a different kind of antibody usually. Um, but the specificity of the antibody stays the same. There might be very uh, slight changes. There is some maturation that can take place and maybe point mutations, but uh, typically uh, whether it's an IgM and then maybe it switches to an IgG, that's still going to rep, uh, recognize the same epitope. Okay, so most often IgMs will change to IgG antibodies because this is the most common antibody in the bloodstream. Um, and it's the longest acting as well. So how long do they act? Um, can be months. Um, I don't really have a good answer to that. How long they ask, it probably depends you know, the infection or, yeah, I, I don't really know. Um, IgG is, is famous not only for being the most abundant and the longest acting, but it's also the one that's able to cross the placenta. Uh, it's the only one. Okay, so uh, it's, it makes sense that it's longer acting because we want to give some antibodies to that developing fetus that hopefully will last into their first few months of life outside the mother, because uh, we know that they don't make, they're not very good at making antibody in their first few months of life. Okay, so that's good that they're long acting. They're gonna protect the newborn baby before they can start making their own. Uh, the one problem with this is RH disease. So all of us have rhesus, well, some of us have rhesus antigens on our red blood cells, right? So if you are A positive, for example, then you're positive for that rhesus antigen. If you're A negative, then you don't have that particular antigen on your red blood cells. Um, only it becomes a problem when the mother is rhesus negative and the baby is rhesus positive, right? So they got that from the father instead of the mother. Um, and usually with the first pregnancy, it's not a problem that there's not a whole lot of mixing of fetal and mother's blood with the first pregnancy, but often there is during birth. So the mother can get sensitized and start making antibody to this antigen that she doesn't have. So for subsequent pregnancies, it can be a problem. Uh, the baby can develop anemia or even potentially die. It's called hemolytic disease of newborns. Okay, but that can be, um, we have ways around that now. We have a Rogam shots that the mother is given like after birth of the first baby. And then, you know, at some point during her second pregnancy that just kind of hides those antigens from the mother. So they don't have that reaction, okay. So IgG antibodies, they're really good at all those different, um, different ways that antibodies work. Uh, right. 
Um, IgA antibodies then, they are best known for being the main antibody uh, on mucosal membranes. Fun fact, I looked this up because I thought maybe I spelled it wrong last time. You spell mucus O-U-S when it's as a, when it's used as an adjective. So we're just we're def describing the membrane. It's a mucus membrane. Uh, if you just say mucus and use it as a noun, you you spell it without the O. Doesn't make any sense to me, but anyway. So this is the main antibody on mucous membranes. Um, it's also found in abundance in our bodily secretions. So things like um, milk, um, tears, saliva. Sorry, by milk, I mean breast milk. Sorry. Okay, so some people, it's easy to think, um, okay, IgA baby, but remember it's the IgG that's are transferred to the baby. So I don't know if you think like goo goo for IgG or something like that. Um, and then the IgA is the one that's in the breast milk. Okay, so um, I don't know. In my mind, they both involve a baby, so I get mixed up in my mind. Um, what else? They're only uh, about 12% of the antibody actually in circulation. But again, on mucous membranes, they're the dominant antibody. And remember, you know, mucous membranes are a pretty por common portal of portal of entry. So this is one defense that we have on mucous membranes. <laughs> okay, we don't have a lot of them. Uh, when uh, <laughs> in circulation, they exist as a monomer, but when they're secreted on mucous membranes, they're usually secreted as a dimer. Okay, so once again, we've got a J chain that's that's joining those monomers into a dimer. Um, and also this other protein, it's called a secretory component that somehow helps that be secreted into that, those mucous membranes. It has some protective function against uh, our enzymes. Say if we're talking digestive tract, Right, there's a lot of digestive enzymes in our digestive tract, and this the secretory component is supposed to help protect that antibody from getting degraded there. Okay, so you know you don't have to really memorize the major roles or what each antibody is good at, but again, just that some antibodies are kind of better at some things than others. Okay, so it's got four binding sites, so it makes sense that it would be uh, a little better at uh, clumping whatever antigen together. Uh, and then the IgE and the IgD, um, put those together here because they're both very rare, okay? Less than 1% of our antibodies in the blood are IgE or IgD. Um, IgE antibodies are most known for being produced during a uh, infection where we're trying to act on parasitic worms. Okay, so remember we talked about the granulocyte eosinophils. Uh, so eosinophils E, you can remember IgE as well. Um, uh, and we also know that you're gonna have a, a higher percentage of IgE in your blood if you're having some kind of allergic reaction. Okay, um, IgD, I don't have a lot to say about them because it's not really clear what exactly they do. They actually stay bound to B cells uh, most of the time. And we think that they maybe have some function in activating the B cell or kind of regulating the reaction there. Uh, uh, but actually, exactly what they do is kind of unclear. Not all mammals have IgD. Um, so it's not clear why we really have some of them. Um, other mammals have different types of isotypes, like sharks have IgW, for example. So there is some variation in animals. Okay, so we talked about uh, the structure of antibodies and what they do. Um, 
going back to that variable region of antibodies, um, I, I mentioned that we, we pretty much have an, a, a B cell receptor and thus antibodies that we could make that would match anything. Um, so it's estimated that we uh, would need 100 million different antibodies. So it's kind of mind blowing. So for a long time, researchers were really stumped how we generated that because we only have about 25,000 genes. So even if you, have, if you have one gene making one kind of antibody, that the math just doesn't work there, okay? So the question is, how is that uh, generated? Uh, and you can read more about this in your book if you want, uh, but I decided to kind of simplify this a little bit. Um, and what I want you to know about this, um, let me just see. Okay. Um, basically, it's not one gene makes one antibody, or, or let's let's call it a B cell receptor. Okay, not one gene, <laughs> one B cell receptor. Okay, so the genes for making B cell receptor actually, we think that there's a number of recombination events that take place. And so you have one G with all these variations on it. And then an enzyme goes down and like picks out one, one kind of each of these variations. It's kind of like uh, shuffling a deck of cards. And then you kind of just get stuck with randomly different variations. So we think that's basically how that, that B cell receptor um, diversity gets generated. So um, it's um, recombination events. So that's, you know, at the level of transcription, basically, um, the, the DNA and then what gets actually transcribed and then translated, it's just kind of a random sampling, um, are going to generate uh, the B cell receptor diversity. Okay, so again, you can read about this in your book if you want. This is basically what I want you to take away from this. With all, you know, doing the math with all the possible recombination between the heavy chains and the light chains, we come up with somewhere between 10 to the 23 different possible B cell receptors. So uh, again, we have that diversity, those B cell receptors. Unfortunately, we only have a, B, a few B cells that might have one specificity. So it might take a while uh, in the course of an infection until those B cells find the appropriate antigen. But once they do, then they make more of themselves. Uh, that's the clonality of it. Uh, and, and then uh, the infection gets fought that way. Okay. Um, and the T cell receptors, it's, it's kind of the same idea. All right, so moving into T cells. Uh, there are several different kinds of T cells. We are gonna focus on the first two here. Uh, cytotoxic T cells. Uh, remember, the T cells are made in the red bone marrow and then travel to the thymus to differentiate into the different kinds of T cells. Uh, what they do is they directly kill cells that are infected, okay, with some intracellular pathogen. So some bacteria can be intracellular. Uh, but mostly we think of viruses, right? Viruses have to be inside a cell in order to reproduce, okay? So a virus is a good example of an intracellular pathogen, okay? So what cytotoxic T cells do is they kill those host cells in order to get rid of the virus. So they're kind of um, our heavy artillery you could think of. Um, they are characterized by having a particular uh, surface receptor, cluster of differentiation eight. Okay, so we abbreviate that and call that CD8. Okay, again, that's a surface receptor protein, and I'll show you uh, a picture of that um, pretty soon. Uh, and then we have helper T cells. They often are thought of as kind of the general that coordinates the entire immune response. So lots of communication, uh, regulation of the whole immune response. They have a little different uh, cluster 
of differentiation, they are positive for that CD4 receptor. Okay, so you've heard of these cells. These are the cells. HIV actually um, will infect a lot of different kinds of cells, but it's the CD4 positive helper T cells that it really just destroys. So basically when you take out that, that, that kind of cell that coordinates the whole immune response, then you're, you're taking away a, a big chunk of our ability to fight that pathogen. These helper T cells, as we will see, are going to differentiate into T helper type one or T helper type two cells, uh, depending on what kind of uh, cell that they're going to activate. Okay, so T helper one uh, produces cytokines that drive the development and activation of cytotoxic T cells when they're fighting those virally infected cells and T helper two cells are going to work to stimulate B cells and activate them to make, uh, to be, become plasma cells and make antibodies. And then just to mention, there's another kind of T cells called regulatory T cells. Um, they have some function in kind of dampening down an immune response to make sure it doesn't get out of control. Uh, the mechanism as to how they do that is complicated and a little beyond what we want to get into here, but I'll just mention that they exist. All right, so we look at T cell receptors and compare them to B cell receptors. Okay, so we talked about these already. Uh, there are some similarities here with the T cell receptor, you know, they span the membrane. Um, they have a constant region and a variable region. Okay, so this is where they're going to bind. Uh, epitopes. Um, I don't actually know what these carbohydrates do, so don't worry about that. I don't even know why the book bothers to point those out. Um, so a few uh, differences, and I alluded to this before. Um, B cell receptors, they are going to recognize antigen directly. like you see in that picture, they're recognizing the epitopes of antigens. Uh, T cell receptors, on the other hand, uh, only recognize antigen uh, when it's presented in a special way by MHC glycoproteins. So in other words, T cells are a little finicky. Uh, they, they, they won't touch the antigen themselves exactly. They, they like to have it presented to them in a certain way in order for them to respond. Okay. Um, all right, so let's look at the, that mechanism uh, whereby antigen is uh, presented to them is by MHC glycoproteins. Okay, so my first slide here, this is just sort of an overview. I just wanted to make sure I didn't forget to say any of these things. So I'm going to kind of move back and forth between the slides a little bit. Uh, but these are our surface glycoproteins that span the cell membrane. We've got them on almost all of our cells. Okay, and there's two different kinds. There's MHC class one and there's MHC class two. All right, so let me come back to the slide. I'll make sure that I say all that stuff. But let's go to your books graphic. Okay, so first of all, MHC class one, we have that on every nucleated cell in our body. So is that all our cells or are there certain cells in our body that don't have nuclei? What kind of cells don't have nuclei? I heard some mumbling, but okay. There's a type of cell in our body that started out with nuclei, but then lost it. Okay, red blood cells. Okay, so red blood cells, no MHC class one. Okay, other than that, pretty, pretty much other cell in our body, as far as I'm aware, has a nucleus. Okay, so every nucleated cell has these MHC class one glycoproteins. Um, and, and what they do, is we have a mechanism, I'll show you that in our next slide, to sample where all the proteins in our cell 
in that cell is sampled and then presented on the outside of the cell. Okay, so presents uh, cells, a sampling of the cell's proteins. Okay. So in other words, it kind of volunteers what's in the cell. Okay, so I MHC class one, when you raise your hand, you volunteer, all right? So that's one arm, you're volunteering. Okay, so this is our cell's mechanism to just advertise what's going on within the cell. All right, so let me show you a little bit kind of basically how that happens. Again, this is figure 16.6 from your book. Um, again, within every cell, um, there is a mechanism, uh, proteolysis, uh, not a, proteoly a proteasome complex. So you have a complex actually of enzymes that will go around and just cut up proteins throughout your cell. And that seems like that would be a bad thing, but apparently we can do that on a small scale. Um, and those cut up proteins get transferred into the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, because on the, on the, in the ER, that's where those MHC1 proteins are expressed. And you can see we have different varieties of them. So we have uh, different ones that are gonna recognize different epitopes. Okay, so uh, we just have little bits, maybe 10 to 20 amino acid bits of proteins from all over the cell. Um, they will match up with maybe some of our MHC and those are transferred through the cell in a membrane bound vesicle and eventually move to the surface. Uh, and those are presented on the surface. Okay, so if these are self proteins or self epitopes, uh, then what happens? Well, they should be ignored. <laughs> okay, so if the cell is healthy, no problem, nothing's going to happen. But if there is some intracellular pathogen, if there is say a virus infecting the cell, uh, then this is the mechanism, again, that the rest of our immune system, like our, like our T cells are going to recognize that. Okay, then that will be advertised on the surface. Okay, so how else is our immune system supposed to know if there is a pathogen inside of a cell? Okay, so uh, and the MHC class one is going to present its antigen to the cytotoxic T cells. Okay, so that's the type of cell that recognizes the antigen presented by MHC class one. Some of our cells have MHC class two. All right, so let me go back to this graphic. Uh, class two MHC uh, is on some of our cells on antigen presenting cells. So that's going to be macrophages, uh, dendritic cells, and actually B cells. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the macrophages and dendritic cells, we talked about that before, how they will phagocytize antigen, uh, and then they have a mechanism to present, uh, kind of advertise on the surface what was in that, that endosome that they phagocytized. Okay, so these cells have MHC class two. They also have MHC class one because they're nucleated cells. Okay, so they have both. All right, so if we look at how the MHC class two works, um, and there is a, a nice video tutor here as part of your homework, it's called processing antigen. So don't skip over that. Uh, so our cells like say this is a macrophage, for example, uh, it's going to phagocytize some pathogen and then um, the MHC class two proteins, they are actually expressed in the ER and then kind of travel and, and fuse with the phagolysosome 
and, ex and then uh, are going to match up with the different epitopes, maybe again, short amino acid fragments here. Some of them may match up with. Uh, and then they are again, advertised on the surface. Um, in your version of the textbook, the sixth version, they draw another picture um, just to kind of show those MHC class two, you know, maybe presenting antigen on their surface. Like that. So I, didn't, I didn't post the most recent one because it was little tiny small pictures. Uh, again, here's a macrophage. Okay, so they, uh, the MHC class two is going to present antigen to T helper cells. Okay, MHC class one present to cytotoxic T cells, MHC class two present to T helper cells. Okay. So you start to understand a little bit, um, MH, the, these MHC glycoproteins, they're actually, um, the, um, the gene that, that makes them, it's called a polymorphic gene. So basically we all have different variations of that MHC glycoprotein gene. So that means that our, our MHCs here are slightly different. So, so basically, if maybe you and I were both exposed to the same pathogen and we're both healthy, uh, you know, in the same amount, one of us may get sick and one of us not. Um, part of that is just genetic differences in our immunity. Um, one of those differences being that um, slightly different amino acids uh, segments might get presented. Um, and so that might dictate whether our immune system is successful or not in fighting off the pathogen. Um, so if you are related to someone, you're most, more, much more likely to have a MHC uh, glycoproteins that are similar. Um, if you're not related, then it's like you have a match with like one in 500,000 people on the street. Okay, but that's one of the things that they will use when they look at, at organ transplant rejection. Um, so I know blood type is another thing, but they like to have that closely match uh, when, when you're going to uh, match up organs. Okay, so um, again, the MHC thing is, is always a little bit sticky. You gotta go over it a few times to, to really feel comfortable with it. But remember, if, if the cell is healthy, there shouldn't be any immune response. Um, here's just a little sum up here um, of, of what cell they're presenting to. Okay, so again, MHC class one, volunteering what's in the cell. You raise your one hand, you're volunteering. MHC class two, if you're, that's a macrophage saying, look what I'm dealing with. Those macrophages that are expressing that um, pathogen that they chewed up, they're going looking for a T helper cell that's going to help them deal with it. Okay, so two hands here, you deal with this. Okay, that, that kind of helps me remember um, which is which a little bit. And again, maybe develop your own mnemonic. Okay, so that will lead us into next time how T helper cells are activated and B cells are activated. So we, that's like the end of the really tough stuff. We will start on vaccines, probably finish vaccines on Tuesday as well. Okay, so have a good weekend. Read a little bit of the book. Spare time.